John 3.16. It's a wonderful verse. It's a wonderful truth. It's a wonderful truth that so, so many folks in our world um, have yet to hear about, actually. Um, the story goes that um, way back in the early 20th century, which I know is ancient history for some of you youngsters, but uh, there are one or two of us that you know, vaguely remember those times. But in the, in the early 20th century, there was a guy called Nikolai Ivanovich Bukharin, and he rose in the ranks of the Russian Communist Party. He was the editor of the Soviet newspaper Pravda. He was a full member of the Politburo. He was a big guy. And in 1930, he traveled to Kyiv, very topical in today's news, really. He traveled over to Kyiv to address, to speak to a huge assembly. And his subject was atheism, atheism. He, as far as he was concerned, there was no God and he was going to condemn faith. And he addressed the crowd and he hurled insults and arguments and what seemed to him proof against the Christian faith. An hour later, he finished. So this was some rant that he went for. He looked down to what seemed to be the smoldering ashes of people's faith, and he said, are there any questions? And it was very quiet. Silence filled the auditorium, but then one man rose to his feet, approached the platform, came up and stood at the lectern near to that communist leader. And this guy looked out and he surveyed the room and then he shouted something. He shouted the ancient greeting ingrained in the hearts and minds of Ukrainian and Russian Christians for centuries. He shouted out, Christ is risen. And en masse, the room stood to their feet and responded. It came as a crashing sound. They responded, he is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. It turns out that God was alive and well. Yeah? Amazing. The cross speaks. The cross speaks. It does. It speaks today. The empty tomb speaks. And it's worth us just giving the cross and the empty tomb just a little space just to speak to us this morning. To arrive at the empty tomb, of course, we first come to the cross. We travel through the cross. And let's spend a couple of minutes just thinking about this journey. Just four words, really, four thoughts. First word I want to bring to you is the word tragedy tragedy and and if you want to expand that think in terms of the tragedy of sin actually there's a young man in his prime he's just turned 33 years old ish he's been betrayed falsely accused and unjustly condemned and it doesn't take long for us to realize when we start looking at this story that this cross represents a tragedy of the highest order and we ponder a bit further and we realize it's not just any man at all. This is the Son of God. That we, ordinary folks, it turns out, condemned to death. How did this happen? How did it happen? Surely there must have been another way. Surely God could have resolved things without going to such extremes. And then as we give it space, another thought might stir, just at the back of our minds. But God is God. And if God is God, if he's, if he's infinite, if he's unchanging, if he's self-sufficient, if he's all-knowing, if he's all-powerful, if he's all-present, if he's wise and faithful and good and loving and perfect, Therefore, if that's who he is, and this is his conclusion, this is the answer that he came to. If he decided that this is the only way, then maybe this tragedy is greater than we thought. 
could it be, could it be that the, the real tragedy in this Easter story is us? Is us. The real tragedy that sits behind the necessity for the cross is the tragedy of our condition, the world's condition. What the Bible calls sin, all the stuff that gets in the way that comes between us and God because of our decision to turn away, go our own way, ignore him, do our own thing. And it's a tragedy that cannot fix itself. And as we ponder this, we begin to grasp something of the lengths that God will go to. We realize something about ourselves as well. That we need to change. Change our ways, change the direction we're headed, find a different course to repent, to turn around. And God comes to help us with this. And as we ponder these things, we hear something else. We might just hear Jesus' words differently, hear them personally, as he says to me and to you, Father, forgive, forgive. And then there's another word that comes to mind as we, we look at this, this Easter story. And that word is sacrifice, or the necessity of sacrifice, the cost of it all, the price Jesus was prepared to pay because God's love is just so great, his sacrifice. We live in a time when speaking of sacrifice is not really typical language anymore. It's not a popular attitude, actually, giving up stuff. Sure, people are generous. People give of their surplus, but most, most folks prefer a religion that doesn't ask these things of us, doesn't ask us to sacrifice, to give up so much that it hurts in one way or another. We prefer, actually, the language of indulgence, do your own thing. But here on the cross is sacrifice, God's sacrifice. Jesus could have said, I'm not going there. I am not going to do this. In fact, his, his prayer in the garden in Gethsemane that we considered on, on Thursday evening, it makes it clear that Jesus was not really that keen on the prospect of what was coming next. But nevertheless, he said, Father God, Father God, your will be done. This is the conclusion you've come to. This is the way it's got to be. And he willingly gave himself. There was necessity for this sacrifice, atonement for this tragedy of sin. We and the whole world, for that matter, could not put right what we'd broken, what we damaged by choosing our own way. And this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Innocent, he took the rap in our place, substituted himself to wipe our slate clean. Third word. Because within this story, we cannot escape this third word. There's grief. There's grief in this genuine grief. The cross is surrounded by it. Death does that. It raises this subject. Death interrupts our plans. That's the subject that we avoid in polite conversation. Death grates with us. It just does. It grates with us. Death grieves us in many ways. Something inside of us cries out, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be this way. And Easter is so, so special because every one of us wants to live beyond the grave. Every one of us wants to cheat death. 
every one of us grieves what none of us can avoid. Because planted inside every one of us is this seed, the seed that reaches out for immortality, because we are created in the image of an immortal God. And we desire to live. And we get to the fourth word, which is a bit more cheery in all fairness. And the fourth word is joy. Hence the joy of Easter morning. And we might say the certainty of joy. That's the message of the resurrection. Look in the tomb. It's empty. It's empty. Travel with the women down the garden path that we read about in the Gospels. Come to the open tomb. Look inside at the undisturbed grave clothes and realize that he's not here. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is alive. Hear the excited words as the women go from person to person saying, he's alive. He's not there. He's alive. He's not there. Over and over again. And folks are getting over their disbelief and all the rest of it. Jesus is living proof that death is not the end and that there is, there is a forevermore. Do you believe that? Oh, I was just wondering for a moment then. I was kind of hoping for the odd amen or two, just to, just to make sure that I... Thank you very much. I am on the right track then, am I? Okay, that's good. That's good. When we look at the empty tomb, when we look just through the, through the, the entrance and look inside, we can just draw one conclusion. One conclusion. Something happened here. The story goes that a first-time traveler looked over the brim of the Grand Canyon and the scale of it, and the, the, the first thing this person said when they looked out and all of this, they said, wow, something happened here, didn't it? And when we look in the empty tomb, it's the same. Wow, something happened here. Something wonderful, something glorious, something eternal. Death and sin have been defeated. Everything to do with our hope in God is here, in an empty tomb. In an empty tomb. Know the certainty of joy this morning, this Easter morning, because something happened here. Yeah? Something happened here. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen indeed. The cross and the empty tomb speak today. If we just pause and listen for a moment to what they have to say. The tragedy of sin, the necessity of sacrifice, but the certainty of the joy of the empty tomb. Yeah? Amen. Amen. Okay, that's great. Good, we're going to um, sing uh, again for a moment. Um, and I think we're going to sing, shall we sing Thine Be the Glory?